In honor of the Lord's uh, word, let us do what uh, this congregation always does, uh, stand for the reading uh, of the word of God. I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 40 through verse 48, and I've entitled the sermon, The Interrupted Miracle, because that's exactly what it was. It says, now, when Jesus returned, the crowd uh, welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him, and there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went... The people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. And she came up behind him and touched the, touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all the night it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are that surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touch me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling. And falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Please be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning in awe. I thank you so much for the beautiful singing that just took place. Uh, Lord, singing unto you, the author and finisher of our faith. How wonderful it is that we, brothers and sisters in Christ, can gather and honor and worship you. Lord, from the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, the, one of the entire themes of Scripture is to understand, honor, and worship the Lord Jesus Christ as he's revealed in your word. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would give us a wise and understanding heart, that you would give us a proper understanding of your ways, that uh, you would open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your law and in your gospel. I pray that you would make us mighty in the scriptures, and that we may complete, that we may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, increase our faith, and may our hearts be purified by this faith. Lord, make us able to love our enemies and to bless those that curse us and to pray for those that persecute us and help us to do good to those that hate us. Let us be patient, Lord, with one another, and forgive one another in love, even as Christ forgave us. And give us grace today. Give us grace, Lord, to take up our cross daily and follow you. Lord, I pray specifically for the church in the Middle East, brothers and sisters that are that are killed. They're martyred because perhaps they have a Bible or they profess allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we this morning are able to come in this beautiful building in very uh, ideal circumstances and uh, worship you. Father, we pray for Pastor Dave as he and his family are on vacation, seeing his family that he doesn't get to see very much. Lord, I know his love of you and love of his family and love of these people. And I know this congregation reciprocates that love. There's a lot of love in this building, Lord. 
and we thank you for it. I would pray for this city, that not only from this pulpit this morning, but the word of the living God would be proclaimed and spoken from every pulpit in this town, in this state, in this country. And Lord, if revival is going to start, why can't it start with us? It starts somewhere. Lord, I never want to lose, and I know we don't want to ever lose, that first love. Lord, the excitement and the joy and the thrill of you coming into our heart and changing us and making us the people that you want us to be. So I would pray this morning, Lord, that you awaken us to your word, and we'll be careful to praise and thank you, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 1933, a young teenage boy in Cleveland, Ohio, wrote a short story, and it was called The, uh, the Superman. And he, his name was Jerry Siegel, and he conspired with another teenage friend named Joe Schuster. And he and Joe Schuster refined their, their, uh, their idea of the Superman, and they sold it to Dell Comics, or the DC Comics. So if you have a 1938 June version of the Superman by DC Comics, and it's in mint condition, you may be able to buy a house and a car, maybe a couple of cars, and uh, put the rest of it in the bank to retire on. Uh, Twenty-two years after 1938 would have been 1960, and something called the Justice League was formed. It's now a movie that's out in the theaters. The Justice League is Superman and Batman and... Uh, who else? Uh, Wonder Woman, Flash, and they've added some characters onto that now. And the reason I'm telling you that is because the person that plays the character of Batman in this movie is named Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck said some amazing things. Listen to what he said. He said, wouldn't it be nice if somebody could save us from all this? Save us from ourselves, and save us from the consequences of our actions, and save us from people who are evil. To save us from ourselves is exactly right, because left to ourselves, without intervention of the Christ of the cross, we all self-destruct. The gospel tract that I remember reading many years ago, it was just a rather large sheet of paper, and it said on the outside, what must I do to go to hell? And you open it up, and it's blank. You don't have to do anything. As sweet as a little child is, and as sweet as some children grow up to be, and as nice as some adults are, without the intervention of the Christ of the cross, the end is destruction. You see, we've all inherited Adam's sin. In reality, we need a God who saves us from ourselves and literally saves us from himself. Remove the Christ of the cross. And we're all condemned to separation from God. You see, Jesus Christ is no imaginary hero that's dreamed up by a couple of teenagers. He's the most unique person that has ever lived. Only he can save us from ourselves and from the consequences of our own actions. It takes more than unbelief to see Jesus as only a good or moral man. 
Scripture tells us that Satan himself, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, tells us that he has blinded the eyes of unbelievers, lest they see the truth of the gospel and believed. Aren't you glad? Aren't you appreciative? Aren't you thankful? I don't know the words that I can use in the English language to express the appreciation that you and I have to someone who shared that gospel with us. I can, I could list a half a dozen names off the top of my head of people that were hitting me with the gospel 43 years ago. I showed little to no interest. Little by little, God did his work. Aren't we faithful or aren't we glad that the Lord is faithful to be patient with us? What if he just gave us the gospel one time and we said no and he said, that's it, it's over. But he's patient and he works with us. Uh, I have no clue of Ben Affleck's spiritual condition, but he did ask some probing questions there, did he not? Every miracle and every parable that Jesus taught, and as it happened as he taught, is teaching us about ourselves. As we look at this parable in just a few minutes, or as we look at this miracle, rather, in a few minutes, I think we'll be able to see ourselves in it. You say, wait a minute, I don't have a, an issue like that, and I'm not a woman. No, the Lord's getting far beyond that. He's getting far beyond the physical. He's looking at a woman who is in great need. Let me tell you something. Every person that's ever been born on this planet is in great, great need. And God looks far beyond, as I said, the physical, and he looks at the spiritual. In these miracles and in the parables... We see much more of ourselves than oftentimes we want to admit. Jesus did things that only God could do. He spoke to a plant and it died. The fig tree. The disciples were shocked and amazed that it died so quickly. He told the hurricane to be quiet and it did. He had power over sickness, power over death. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, God the Father calls the Son God. He says in verse 5 of Hebrews 1, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And likewise, or and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, <laughs> is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You cannot honestly read the Bible and not see that Jesus claimed to be God, the Father claimed him to be God, and the Spirit claimed him to be God. You have to read that. Sadly, the cults in the world deny every major doctrine of the precious faith that you and I believe. If this life is all there is, Life would be cruel. However, in this life, as Martin Lloyd Jones says, you and I live this life, and all it is is the foyer to the real life. We're in the foyer. It's like a child in the womb, and they're born into this world. Totally different than what they were accustomed to for some nine months. If you live to be a hundred, you get your name in the paper. But a hundred years is not very long compared to eternity, is it? So only God is eternal. And through His Son, He gives us the gift of eternal life. What are you going to give for Christmas? What am I going to give for Christmas? And I've said before, whatever we give is not much more than a trinket. Because God gives us eternal life and they shall never die or we shall never perish. You know, the Bible never speaks of the believer dying. I was reading in the Old Testament about the story in Genesis of Jacob. When Jacob died, when it was time for him to pass on, it says that he drew his feet up into the bed and was gathered 
with his people. Is that not the most beautiful description of death that you have ever heard? For the Christian, we're simply gathered with our people. Who on the planet would I rather be with this morning than you folks? Folks that have this same God that worked in your life and worked in your heart, he's working in mine, he's working in ours. And someday we will see these saints of the Bible, the saints of church history, the brothers and sisters and our own families and friends who have already passed on and go. We also will be gathered with our people. There's some 37 miracles recorded in the Bible. Jesus lived the... Conservative scholar says about 33 and a half years, only three and a half years of those were ministry. Between 36 and 42 months, he walked the earth and performed miracles. Yet John 20:25 20, tells us this. <clears throat> John says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. <laughs> it tells us of 37 miracles, and the reality of it is he probably did 37,000 miracles. But the Bible tells us that the world itself couldn't contain. William Hendrickson is a great commentator who has been with the Lord some time now, and he had a unique look at Scripture uh, and a wonderful look at Scripture, and he says, Did you ever notice that how many times the Lord, in just a regular daily day for him, he was interrupted? Now, if you and I are interrupted, uh, we may lose our train of thought. But the Lord Jesus never looked at an interruption as interrupting a train of thought. He looked at it as a golden opportunity. Let me just share with you a few examples of when the Lord was interrupted. One day in Mark 1, he was in the house crowded with people. Scripture doesn't say how large it was or how many people were in it, but, it, but there was a massive number of people crammed into that house. Say if there was, Dave told me once, Pastor Dave told me that this church could possibly hold 500 people. Uh, say there's 700 showed up this morning then it would be rather packed, wouldn't it? Well, I think this is a scene that we see in Mark 1, that Jesus was preaching. And while he was doing this, some fellows had the bright idea, why don't we just tear a hole in the roof and let our friend down, because we can't get to Jesus and he needs Jesus. And so that's what they did. They tore the roof down, they brought it down, and so... Jesus used that interruption as an opportunity to teach and an opportunity and an opportunity to heal this man. What about in John chapter 16 when Jesus was talking to his disciples? He was talking to them about his death, burial, and resurrection. And Peter steps up and says, No, Lord, no, no, no. You've got it wrong, Lord. You cannot die. What was the Lord's response to him? Get behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're saying, Peter. What about another time? In Matthew 26, 31, he's in the garden, and he's telling them right before the crucifixion that all of you are going to fade away. Every one of you will fall. Who else but Peter steps up and says, Lord, they might fade away. They might deny you, but I never will. And the Lord says, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And then all the others said the same thing that Peter had said. Lord, Lord, no, 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 we won't, we won't deny you. Well, let's move on with the story. Jesus was traveling one day and thousands of people have gathered around him and two men yelled, Son of God, David, Son of God, have mercy on me. And the crowd hush him and say, be quiet. And the Lord takes that opportunity, that interruption, to heal those two blind men. He asked them first, doesn't it seem like a strange question the Lord asked them? What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, we, we, we want to see our... We want to see. They might have had some other ailments, but the number one ailment they wanted corrected was their eyes. Well, 
As I've already said, the Lord was sleeping as this hurricane was going on. And they interrupted him and said, Lord, don't you care that we're dying? Wake up. So they interrupted his sleep. He tells the storm to be quiet. Then in, also later on, he's praying. He goes out a great while before day because he knows the massive crowds that he's going to face. So he goes out to get some precious quiet time with his, uh, with his God, with the Father. And as he's doing that, as he's praying, here comes Peter again. Peter and the other disciples, and they say, Lord, Lord, we've got to go. There's, there's crowds waiting on us. And so the Lord said, let us go preach. And as, he, and as he went, he taught and he preached. Well, that brings us to the message that we've got here. We see that uh, this woman, this was an interruption of of a miracle that he was going to perform with Jairus. Now Jairus, it says, the, the text tells us that Jairus came and fell at his feet. You see, Jairus was important. He was a leader. He was a ruler in the synagogue. So when you're important, and you're a very important person, you have an entourage of people, and the higher up you are, the more important you are, you can be heard and seen by all. And that was what happened to the Lord here. Or what happened to Jairus? He comes and says, my daughter is so sick, she's about to die. And this woman comes up, and it says, as he was going, as he went, this woman comes. Now let me tell you about the need of this woman. Point number one, she had a great need. You see, she was ceremonially unclean. You have any idea what that meant? See, in the Old Testament law, there were dietary laws, foods they could eat and couldn't eat. And by the way, that applies not to us today. The Lord had to give Peter a vision from heaven. Remember, Peter gets a vision like a, a tent or a big cloth is coming down. And it's got all kind of creatures in it. For, and he says, you can eat anything. And Peter had to be reminded of that on several occasions. That he could eat whatever he wanted to eat. So there were dietary laws, moral laws, which never changed, and ceremonial laws. She was considered ceremonially unclean. She had a womanly issue. She had a discharge not for 12 days, not for 12 weeks, not for 12 months, for 12 years. I don't think the Scripture can... Tell us the enormity, just reading in the English Bible here, the enormity of that ceremonial uncleanness that she had. Do you know what was involved with that? She could not go to the synagogue. She was not allowed in the synagogue because she was considered unclean. Anybody that touched her would have been unclean. She couldn't go to the uh, tabernacle or to the temple. She could not touch her husband or her children. You know the, the need of bonding a child, a little baby, a little infant, and you can't touch that child? Or they would become unclean. She could not touch them. She had to struggle in a very weakened state with this enormous crowd. Mark chapter 5, his, uh, his take on this passage in Luke says that she got progressively worse. In other words, the third year was worse than the second year, sixth year worse than the fifth, eighth year worse than the seventh. In other words, this thing wasn't stabilized. She's getting worse and worse and worse. She had this incredible need. And then she has spent, one of the uh, gospel accounts tells us that she had spent all of her money, everything she had, had gone to doctors and she was getting worse, not getting better. She wasn't even getting stabilized. She's getting worse. And she's getting worse and worse. Three reasons I think the Lord did miracles. One was to increase the disciples' faith. If he just wanted to show his deity, he could have done that in a thousand different ways. He could have just said, human be born. Or horse be born, or he could have levitated in the sky, or anything to show that he was different than anybody else, but he didn't do that. He took opportunities where it hits people the hardest is when physical things go wrong, it gets our attention, does it not? 
Three reasons he did miracles was to increase the disciples' faith and because he had compassion on people. He looked at this woman that had this issue and she was just in dire straits. And he had compassion on her. Compassion is doing what's ever necessary to heal the hurts of other people. Physically, mentally, emotionally, however that might be. And to show that we have spiritual needs far beyond the physical needs. Well, she touched his garment. That's point number two. She had a need and she touched his garment. Rabbis wore robes with tassels on them. The fringe of the, the, fringe of the garment. The Pharisees made their tassels three times bigger than any other rabbis because it would make them look spiritual and make them look holy. That's why they stood on the street corners and prayed. They wouldn't pray inside the assembly. They'd go on the street corners and lift their hands and pray in loud voices so everyone could hear them and see how holy they were. When it was time for the offering plate to pass, they would announce how much they had put into the plate. I have just put $500 in the plate. Is anybody that missed that? As a matter of fact, give me the microphone. Let me announce how much I put in. They wanted to be seen of men. But you know, our English translations don't get the, the, the full drift of what happened here when it says that she reached out and touched him. The word touch means to grab or to clutch. If you have a small child and you're on a, the streets busy and that child steps out, are you going to just touch your child's coat or are you going to grab it and clutch it and clutch him, clutch whatever it takes to pull him back from that danger that he doesn't even know he's facing? Well, that's the clutch that this woman made right here. Why did she do that? I think because I think we've painted this uh, the picture already that she was desperate. There's nowhere else to turn. She's heard about this Christ. She's heard about the enormous crowds that follow him. She's heard of the healings, the blind, the dead that are raised. She's heard the miracles. Maybe he can help me. She's in dire straits. That's the condition that we're in when we really truly see ourselves, as the Lord said at the Sermon on the Mount, when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. When we see ourselves as spiritually bankrupt and there's no hope whatever, then we come to Christ. John Owen said, in the seed of every heart is the seed of every sin. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, okay, you made a decision. You've turned over a new life. Exactly where does Jesus Christ fit into all this? Where does he fit into your decision? The demand is still the same as it was 2,000 years ago. In Luke 9.23, Jesus said, if anyone, he doesn't qualify it, are you an anyone? I'm an anyone, so are you. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus or any other writer ever say, there comes a time in this life when you put it down. Jim Elliot said, he is no fool to lose that which he cannot keep, to gain that which he cannot lose. In Luke 9, 24, the Lord further says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, in a way, this woman's theology was flawed because she thought, if I just touch, if I just touch him, I'll be healed. You see, sometimes people can know a great deal about the Bible. They can know a great deal about the Lord. And they think that a mechanical belief is good enough. Well, let me tell you something. There was nothing supernatural about the Lord's robe. It did not fall down from heaven. It was man-made or woman-made. Somebody made the robe for him. It's, it was a robe that all teachers, all rabbis used when they ministered, when they, when they taught. 
The ESV study note says about this, faith itself did not do the healing. God does. But her faith was the appointed means in her bodily healing as well as her spiritual salvation. Ephesians says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is the means that he uses. Metal is a conduit of electricity, not electricity itself. Jesus would not allow her to have a second class healing. He wanted no misunderstanding of the miracle. He didn't want her to have guilt. She knew that she had received the gift of grace. He didn't want her faith to go unnoticed. It wasn't the miracle so much as he wanted seen, but it was the faith of this woman that she had to be healed. Two thousand years removed, here I stand sharing with you the faith of this woman. Two thousand years later. And if the Lord tarries his coming another two thousand, someone will be reading the same story. But you don't just confine it to this. You can find it to, you're here this morning and you know Christ. <laughs> faith was used as a means to bring you to this same Lord, was it not? What was the result of touching his Touching his garment. Well, she was immediately healed. She instantly knew that she was healed. Let me ask you this. Do you have a splitting headache? I mean, a, a, a splitting headache so bad that you have to lie down, and then you get up and that headache's not there? Do you know that it's gone? Yes, of course you know. Then this woman knew instantly that she was healed. After 12 long years... She had been healed. Mark 5.29 says this, And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed at her, of her disease. Verse 30, And Jesus perceiving in himself, Now catch this, we get an insight of the God-man. What was going on in the God-man's life here? It says, And Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched me? Peter. Oh, wonderful Peter, once again, said, Lord. <laughs> How can you even ask that question? Look at all the people around. Population of Rock Hill is ballpark 70,000. I don't know how many people are in churches this morning. I don't know how many people that are inside the churches have been touched by this same Lord spiritually. Dave spoke last Tuesday and said he was talking to some pastors, and this one pastor told him that 2% of his congregation may be Christians. 2% may be Christians. I know. That's not a fact in this church. Because God has raised up a young man to preach and proclaim the truth. And you folks, and this wonderful congregation of you folks, have received that truth with gratitude and thankfulness. And God is doing a wonderful work in this church because of his word. He wasn't asking for information here. He was asking a convicting question. He knew power had gone out of him. We get a glimpse, I said, of the God-man here. To quote the ESV note once again, probably some physical sensation in his body, not by merely being touched, but by being touched by someone who had faith that he could heal her. Every line, every word in here is for a reason. It's not just a filler. It's not just to fill up the pages. She came trembling. And the Septuagint the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, it says that when God came down to give the law to Moses, that, the, uh, that Mount Sinai shook. It violently shook. That's what happened to this woman. Same word used here. This woman was visibly and viably shook when she realized who he was. She knows 
that he knows who she is. Among the thousands, you and I are no different. He knows his sheep. He knows your name. Remember, he fed 20,000 people. 5,000, the scripture said, beside women and children, probably 20,000. We get to the cross, and how many is there? Only John the disciple and the women. By the time we get to the tomb and the third day, John has gone home. Only Mary is there. Mary Magdalene. And she mistook him for the gardener. And then what did the Lord say? He said, Mary. And as soon as he called her name, she recognized who he was. If he knows the names of trillions of stars, don't you think that he knows you? And your doubts and your fears and your frustrations? The highlight of this whole encounter was he looked at her and called her daughter. Pastor Dave is my brother, not physically, but spiritually. And so are each one of you in this church that know Jesus Christ. I hesitate to call any names because I leave somebody out. If you're a believer, a reborn child of God, this same power that flowed from Christ has flowed into your dead soul and made you alive in Him. How am I, how can I make such a claim? And I will end with this, as my time seems to have kind of expired here. James. Chapter 1, verse 18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He brought us forth by the word of truth that spiritually, that's salvation. Us. Who's the us? It's believers. By the word of truth. What is the word of truth? It's the gospel. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He brought us forth from the womb a metaphor of the new birth. So in conclusion, she was immediately healed. She knew that she was healed. She experienced his love personally. Thousands of people around him. Did he perform any other miracles there? He could have. Scripture doesn't tell us. I do know this. That Jesus Christ touched this woman physically. And you and I often live in this life with the consequences of our sins. We age. If Adam had not sinned, he would not have died. He would not have aged. But he did. And so God never had a plan B. <laughs> plan A has always been the cross to redeem his people. Let us pray. Let us close in prayer. Lord, I'm reminded of a song that when I first became a believer was very, very popular, but it had a lot of wonderful words in it. It simply goes like this. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I Right.